telescopes and eyes are both tools for collecting and detecting light. In fact, telescopes can be thought of as bigger, more powerful eyes. The type of lenses and mirrors and their arrangement determine some of the features of the telescope. The resolution of the telescope is a measure of how sharply defined the details of the image can be. The telescope's primary mirror may have a fraction. As a result, starlight is not brought to a focus at the same point, resulting in blurry images. The name telescope covers a wide range of instruments. There are major differences in how astronomers must go about collecting light in different frequency bands. The telescope is widely used in the astronomy field because it is a digital detector, 100 times more efficient than our eyes. Now physicists have begun to develop a various quantum mechanism. There are two main ways that rain forms, and while we're really good at forecasting one kind, we're really bad at predicting the other. The first kind, which makes up about 40% of the rain we experience, is the long-lasting, gray skies all day kind of rain. This comes from giant air masses called fronts, which move around the planet. When a cold one runs into a warm one, the warm one, which is less dense, gets lifted up. As it rises, it quickly cools off, which causes tons of water vapor in it to condense right where the two air masses meet, and then fall as rain, or snow or sleet. Since the fronts themselves are large and easy to track with radar systems, not only can meteorologists tell pretty much exactly where this type of rain will fall, they can also measure the size and temperature of the two air masses and use that to accurately predict how intense the rain will be and how long it will last. But the majority of the rain we experience comes from a process called convection. This type of rain happens when heat from the ground warms up a small mass of air, which then rises and cools, causing the water vapor in it to condense and fall to the ground. That process of rising, cooling and condensing is very similar to what happens with frontal rain. But because convective rain is triggered by heat from a small patch of ground, rather than the temperature difference between two large masses of air, it's much more complicated. It's hard to know how warm various parts of the ground will be at a particular time, whether that heat will be enough to lift a particular mass of air to a particular height, how much water vapor that particular mass of air holds, and how long that particular mass of air will stay over that particular patch of warm ground. Normally when people talk about symbiosis, they're talking about two different types of organisms cooperating to help each other survive. For example, clownfish hide from predators among the tentacles of sea anemones. In return, they feed the anemone with their own droppings. Yum yum. The anemone and the clownfish enjoy a symbiotic relationship. In biology however symbiosis has a broader definition than simple cooperation. It's classically defined as any long-term living together of unlike organisms. Let me say that again symbiosis the long-term living together of unlike organisms. Mutualistic symbiosis or mutualism is when both partners benefit from the relationship, like we saw in the clownfish and the anemone. When I say that both partners benefit from their relationship, what I mean is that both organisms experience a significant increase in evolutionary fitness. They both end up being better at surviving and reproducing. Parasitic symbiosis or parasitism is when one benefits while the other is harmed. Ticks, huh, are a good example of a parasite. They drink your blood and then sometimes repay you with Lyme disease. Total jerks. Commensalistic symbiosis or commensalism is when one organism benefits, while the other is not dramatically helped or harmed. On 27 April 2020, China's Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development issued a notice that introduced measures to, in its own words, further strengthen the management of urban and architectural features. 
The document, which we've translated from its original Chinese, restricts the blind planning and construction of super high rise skyscrapers, and states that new buildings over 500 meters in height are not allowed to be built. The notice also heavily restricts the construction of any buildings over 250 meters in height, except where absolutely necessary, and, where permission is granted, those towers will be subject to intense reviews by the firefighting, earthquake and energy saving authorities. In addition, local governments are now required to tighten the approval process for towers taller than 100 meters, protect natural areas and historic buildings, and appoint chief architects to ensure that any new architecture better represents Chinese culture. The policy also bans plagiarized or copycat architecture, a controversial and head-turning trend which has seen a number of world's most famous buildings replicated across China in recent years. New York's lack of megatall skyscrapers actually has nothing to do with engineering. It's entirely feasible to build over 600 meters high in the city thanks to solid bedrock and an incredible amount of expertise in the local area. If you wanted to build a megatall then you could, but that's the problem. Hardly anyone wants to build a skyscraper that high in this city for a whole host of reasons. Firstly, there just isn't the demand. Manhattan's office market, which drove construction of the Empire State, World Trade Center and one Vanderbilt had become saturated before the pandemic and will likely take some time to recover afterwards. The luxury real estate market, which drove the construction of several super slender towers from small parcels of land along Billionaire's Row in recent years, has also been cooling off. Those structures only really became financially viable because of the prices they were able to command for their location and park views. You couldn't let commercial space for anywhere near the same rate. Past megatall skyscrapers have cost well over a billion US dollars to construct, so any developer would need to recoup a pretty considerable sum from office or residential lets to make a profit. But past megatall skyscrapers were not constructed in New York, a market that frequently tops the list of the world's most expensive cities to build in. Projects here cost several hundred dollars more per square foot to build than in the Middle East or Asia. Black holes are among the most fascinating objects in our universe, and also the most mysterious. A black hole is a region in space where the force of gravity is so strong, not even light, the fastest known entity in our universe, can escape. The boundary of a black hole is called the event horizon, a point of no return, beyond which we truly cannot see. When something crosses the event horizon, it collapses into the black hole's singularity, an infinitely small, infinitely dense point where space, time, and the laws of physics no longer apply. Scientists have theorized several different types of black holes, with stellar and supermassive black holes being the most common. Stellar black holes form when massive stars die and collapse. They're roughly 10 to 20 times the mass of our sun, and scattered throughout the universe. There could be millions of these stellar black holes in the Milky Way alone. Supermassive black holes are giants by comparison, measuring millions, even billions of times, more massive than our sun. Scientists can only guess how they form, but we do know they exist at the center of just about every large galaxy, including our own. Homes are usually the largest purchase of a lifetime. So, every home should stand the test of time. Zero energy ready homes to the rescue. They are designed, constructed, and certified to the federal government's most rigorous guidelines for efficient, healthy, comfortable, and durable homes. This is accomplished with three proven innovations that help every home buyer get the most from their new home. Innovation number one is maximum protection construction. 
This includes industry-leading best practices for roof, wall, window, and foundation assemblies that protect against heat, cold, drafts, and moisture. Innovation number two is advanced technologies. A comprehensive technology package helps your home work and last. High-performance heating and cooling deliver total comfort. Energy Star labeled products save money while exceeding performance expectations. And Solar Ready Construction allows a solar electric system to be added in the future with no cost penalty or disruption. And finally, innovation number three is certified performance. Each home is independently verified to meet all the requirements for three national high-performance home programs. Energy Star Certified Home ensures a strong foundation of above-code efficiency, comfort, and water protection. Indoor Air Plus certification ensures a comprehensive package of health measures that help you breathe better. And Zero Energy Ready Home certification optimizes performance and efficiency so annual energy consumption can be offset with renewable energy. The tech industry loves a buzzword. And right now, everyone is talking about the metaverse. Broadly speaking, the metaverse can be defined as a virtual world where we can live, work, travel and play. But it doesn't actually exist yet, and just like Gaudi's Cathedral, the Sagrada Familia, it may take a while to complete. But that hasn't stopped businesses of all shapes and sizes from trying to get involved. JP Morgan, HSBC, Gucci and Coca-Cola are among a few of the firms that have dabbled with the metaverse so far. And of course, there's Meta, the company formerly known as Facebook. While the metaverse is mostly science fiction at this stage, there are some early versions of it out there that show us what might be possible. Here at Barcelona's Mobile World Congress, many of them are on display. Many in the tech industry claim that the metaverse is the next phase of the internet. Companies like Meta are hailing it as this sort of utopia that will make the time we spend online more interactive and fun. They also say it will present businesses with new ways to make money. Urban development is one of the main ways that human beings impact the earth. From the structures that we call home, to our schools, hospitals, workplaces and the infrastructure that we travel on, our built world now accounts for a significant portion of all greenhouse gas emissions produced worldwide. From initiatives to make entire cities carbon neutral to innovations in concrete manufacture and even smog-eating buildings, the construction industry is beginning to recognize its role and respond but much more needs to be done and at a faster rate. To make a real difference we must reach beyond the construction sector and enable each and every one of us to better understand how our buildings are impacting the planet. Technology can play a key role here, particularly in the form of the digital twin systems that have supported other sectors for many years. Creating a digital replica of a physical building that actually behaves like the real structure and provides crucial information on real-life performance can enable us to better understand how our buildings are performing and simulate how they may perform in the future under a range of scenarios. Leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning, these so-called digital twins can improve energy resilience, reduce operating costs, increase resource efficiency, and help to decarbonize our buildings. Water, it's the most important substance on Earth. Without it, we wouldn't survive. It's also helped power our lives for more than a century. More than 6% of our nation's electricity comes from hydropower. And as wind and solar power continue to grow, water can also play an important role in bringing more renewable resources onto the power grid. One way is by storing energy through a technology known as pumped storage hydropower. Think of it as a big battery, flexible enough to respond to various power demands. When the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, electricity is in high supply, so water is pumped up to higher elevation reservoirs during this time. 
When the sun goes down or the wind stops blowing, water is released back to lower reservoirs, basically filling in the gaps during peak demand and generating the needed electricity. Pump storage is the most dominant form of energy storage on the electric grid today. There's more than 21 gigawatts of storage capacity already installed in the United States, with future opportunities to more than double that, keeping the grid reliable and ready to add more renewable electricity to the mix at low operating costs. There are four types of solar eclipses. The first and most spectacular is a total eclipse, when the moon completely covers the sun's surface. A total eclipse can only be seen if you're standing within the umbral shadow. That's why the imaginary line created by this shadow as it races across Earth is known as the path of totality. People within the penumbral shadow see only a partial eclipse, the second type. From this view, outside the path of totality, the moon passes in front of the sun off center, never fully covering its surface. Third, an annular eclipse, occurs when the moon passes directly in front of the sun. However, unlike a total eclipse, the moon appears too small to fully cover the sun. The moon's orbit is elliptical, so sometimes it's closer to Earth and sometimes it's farther away. Last, a hybrid eclipse, is when the moon's position between the earth and sun is so finely balanced that the curvature of the earth plays a role. The moon will be farther away from some parts of earth along the eclipse's path, resulting in an annular eclipse. In other parts, the moon will be just close enough to fully cover the sun, resulting in a total eclipse. Beer is the most popular alcoholic beverage in the world, a standing that has been boosted by the drink's relative affordability compared to cocktails or wine at a bar. But everyone from multinational brewers to small craft beer companies to pub chains has been warning about the beverage's inevitable price increase. In the United Kingdom, for instance, the average cost of a pint of beer has soared by 70% since the global financial crisis. The mean price for 568 milliliters of brew has gone from two pounds and thirty pence in 2008 to three pounds and ninety-five pence in 2022. The cheapest pint was found in a pub in Lancashire, in the northwest of England, at one pound and seventy-nine pence. The most expensive, London, of course, where one unnamed pub was charging a whopping eight pounds and six pence on average. But London is far from the priciest place to buy a beer. It's the seventh most expensive capital, according to one beer index, which analyzed the price of brew from local supermarkets and hotel lobbies. Tokyo, Bern, Paris, Beijing, Amman and Doha top the list of most expensive places to buy beer, with a pint costing nearly zero in Qatar's capital. Why? The short answer is inflation. The long answer extends from the cost of raw materials to the wages of the bar staff pouring your pint. The rise of technology is a huge opportunity for the construction industry, enabling it to overcome many of its challenges while broadening its appeal to young talent. While automation has already entered construction in a number of ways, taking it much further could be truly transformational, filling the gaps where skilled labor cannot be found, freeing up others to focus on more important work and improving efficiency while raising quality. At the design stage, architects and engineers are already using modeling tools that automate work which would traditionally have been done manually. Some are now using predictive design software, where artificial intelligence, AI, designs buildings and infrastructure compliant with regulations and best practice. While the cultural importance of architecture means that the design process is unlikely to ever be fully automated, AI could soon play a major role in optimizing designs, drawing in best practice from learning across thousands of projects.
By simply entering details about site conditions and our desired outcomes, machines could design the best possible house, hospital or school for that scenario, fully compliant with regulations. Recurring wildfires, unprecedented flooding, persistent droughts. Communities everywhere are experiencing the harmful effects of climate change and more frequent extreme weather events. The science is clear, to stay on a path to net zero, we need an urgent global response. That means rapidly reducing carbon pollution and deploying carbon dioxide removal at scale. Carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, can help address emissions from the hardest to decarbonize sectors and eventually remove the legacy emissions already warming our planet and affecting our health. CDR includes technological approaches like direct air capture with durable storage, separating CO2 from ambient air and then storing the CO2 deep underground in geological reservoirs or in products like concrete. CDR can also be achieved through nature-based approaches like soil carbon sequestration. This involves managing land so that soils absorb and hold more carbon. Minimizing soil tilling is one way to do this, or planting carbon sequestering cover crops between harvests. But as an emerging field, CDR approaches still require significant research, development, and demonstration to ensure CO2 removal can be deployed responsibly, effectively, and affordably to meet national and global net zero goals in the coming decades. The Amazon rainforest is a large tropical rainforest found in South America in the Amazon basin. The forest covers over 5 million square kilometers, covering land in nine countries. The forest can be found in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Guyana, Suriname and French Guiana. Most of the forest, about 60% of its map, exists in Brazil. The rainforest contains an enormous diversity of plant life, with some experts estimating that in just one square kilometer of rainforest, biologists can examine over 75,000 types of trees and 150,000 examples of higher plants. One square kilometer can also hold over 90,000 tons of plant life, which is the largest collection of living plants on Earth. Naturally, with all its abundance of plant life, the Amazon rainforest also holds the largest collection of animal species on Earth. There are over 3,000 species of recognized fish that reside in the Amazon River. The number of recognized fish is still growing and some experts put the figures at 5,000. Inland, the rainforest is host to thousands of other species as well. The region is home to over 2 million insects and thousands of birds and mammals. At last count, the list of recognized species contained 1,294 birds, 427 mammals, 428 amphibians and 378 reptiles. It is estimated that about one-third of all species on Earth reside in the Amazon, making it, along with its plant life, the richest source of biodiversity in the world. The last salmon fillet you had probably never swam freely in the sea. Chances are it was born and raised in a net pen on a fish farm in northern Europe, Chile, or Canada. Aquaculture, raising marine species in environments controlled by humans, brings in a lot of cash, especially for popular delicacies like salmon. And since the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization predicts that by the year 2040, there will be no more fish in the oceans, aquaculture may be the wave of the future. But environmentalists argue that aquaculture is a major source of pollution. Farmed salmon are raised in small net pens in the ocean. To control diseases and parasites, producers use antibiotics and chemicals which pollute ocean waters. 
The salmon farming industry is working hard to develop environmentally friendly technologies such as closed containment systems that would separate the ocean's ecosystem from the polluted waters of salmon farms. The drastic slowdown in the real estate market in the United States is being felt around the world. At the heart of this economic downturn is the subprime crisis facing many American homeowners. The subprime crisis refers to the recent avalanche of homeowners defaulting on their home loans. When someone defaults on a loan, they essentially stop repaying the loan and give up trying to meet the initial repayment plan. Many of these homeowners had subprime loans. These are loans that require little money up front and often start off with affordable payments. However, these subprime loans often have adjustable interest rates, which mean that over time, the interest rate for the loans can drastically go up. Higher interest rates mean higher monthly payments. As a result, homeowners with subprime loans found themselves with rising home payments they could not afford. In many cases, the home loan payments became so large that the homeowners could not meet the monthly payments, and as a result, they had to turn their home over to the bank they borrowed money from. The subprime home loan collapse has not only hit homeowners. Many investment banks that had invested in these loans by financing the loan market have been hit hard as well, as they have not been able to collect on their initial investment. MTV unquestionably revolutionized the music industry. The network debuted in 1981 to a few thousand households on a single cable system. It finished the year with nearly 21 million subscribers. In addition to its music programming, MTV has a long history of promoting social, political, and environmental activism. In doing so, it has come under fire from both liberal and conservative media watchdogs, as well as religious groups over such issues as censorship, political correctness, and perceived negative moral influence on young people. MTV became the first to run TV spots promoting safe sex and AIDS awareness, issues considered far too controversial for major broadcast networks. It also addressed the problem of substance abuse with a series of, just say no, anti-drug spots and a, rock against drugs, campaign. MTV entered the political arena when it launched the, choose or lose, campaign to get students politically involved by increasing voter registration. Fight for your rights, championed the causes of anti-violence and anti-discrimination. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and MTV teamed up to form, think, Education, encouraging students to graduate from high school and be prepared for the responsibilities of college and work. The channel also aired a series of pro-conservation ads called, Break the Addiction, Advocating Reduced Energy Consumption. MTV continues to address current political issues. Think MTV, the network's vehicle for social activism, invites young people to choose the issues that resonate most and take action to make a positive change. Millions of television viewers watching the surfing championships in South Africa witnessed a spectacle that seemed straight out of a horror film. While sitting on his surfboard, waiting to compete, surfer Nick Fanning was seemingly attacked by a great white shark on live television. Or was he? In plain sight, viewers saw the shark slowly emerge from the water and gnaw at his surfboard. Fanning naturally started flailing in the water to get away from the shark, but as rescuers rushed to the scene, the shark simply swam away. Further review of the footage suggests that perhaps the shark was not aggressive at all, and more likely just curious. Scientists now think that sharks use their teeth similarly to the way humans use their fingers or cats use their paws to poke or prod an unknown object. What is unclear to researchers is the nature of most shark encounters. Are the sharks being aggressive or just curious? Data shows that when a shark bites a human, it is more likely to swim away than continue the attack. Most shark attacks do not end in a fatality. 
Still, sharks are ferocious creatures and can be deadly. The most aggressive sharks are bull sharks and mako sharks, although attacks are incredibly rare. These sharks are thought to be aggressive because humans are roughly the same size as seals, one of their main prey in the water. Other sharks, such as the hammerhead shark or nurse shark, usually only attack when provoked. Still, other sharks, like the whale shark, a gentle giant, are no threat to humans. The battle for climate change will be won or lost in cities. Cities play an outsized role in climate change, consuming around 75% of the world's energy and producing more than 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. But they can also be part of the solution, creating meaningful impact while being small and nimble enough to avoid the bureaucracy of global politics. In fact, many have already started work. 2022 marked some of the most extreme weather events on record, with wildfires and droughts ravaging parts of Europe, the US and Africa, while Asia battled disastrous flooding and monsoon rains. And experts warn it's just the beginning. What we calculated and what we knew as, say, 1 in 10 year events is now becoming 1 in 5 years. So, the frequency is increasing. Our cities are at the forefront of those shifts. Today, more than half of the world's population live in urban areas, a figure that's set to rise to 68% by 2050. This migration pattern is driven partly by the climate crisis, which, in turn, creates new risks and stress for urban infrastructures.